I've been sharing on a series called Hope, and uh, this is the eighth message in the series, and uh, this one is called Faith Tested. Have you ever felt your faith tested? Yeah. Uh, maybe you're in a position or a place right now where you feel you're being tested. Hmm? Stanley Baldwin was the British Prime Minister in two terms, 1923 to 1929 and 1935 to 1937. And he made this statement, which I liked, and I posted it some time back on Facebook. It says this, I'm one of those who'd rather sink with faith than swim without it. Pretty profound. I'm one of those who'd rather sink with faith than swim without it. Profound, isn't it? I'm one of those who'd rather sink with faith than swim without it. <laughs> I, I was reading, I, I digress, I, I read a little bit this morning, uh, and it was the original founder of um, Time magazine, the original founder. He was about eight, was around about 1893, don't hold me to it, died about 1967, give or take, or 1883, died 1967, and he's the original founder of Time magazine. And he says, a lot of people think that, and I'm paraphrase a bit. A lot of people think that Time Magazine is the originator of biographies and stories of people. But I'd tell you, it all began with the Bible. I really like that. It's amazing how when you look back at the beginning, how far it's digressed today. Okay, that's just me. I'm not a big fan of Time Magazine today, okay? But when I go back to the origins and see how it began with a man of faith, what it's all about and how it's digressed, it's an amazing area of looking to see how God moves. Because so many times we think the only people who really know God or love God are those who've never gotten anywhere in life or moved anywhere in life. But we have this foundation of men and women, prime ministers, presidents, um, entrepreneurs, whatever else, who have boldly declared a faith in God. What if you're living by faith and yet you don't see God's promise to you fulfilled in your lifetime? I believe that the goals I should set, I set goals like this. I have a one-year goal. I have a five-year goal. I have a 10-year goal. I have a 20-year goal. And what I learned is a 100-year goal. That was from your friend. A 100-year goal. When I first heard that, how many years ago was that? Eight, 10 years ago? Eight years ago? Huh? Not, no, 15 when I first was challenged with the idea, do you have a 100-year goal, it really challenged me because I do not plan to be here in 100 years' time. God have mercy. And when I heard the whole idea of what's your 100-year goal, what is your 100-year goal? If I said to you, write down your goal for 12 months. Okay. Write down your goal for five years. Okay, write down your goal for 10 years, some might struggle. Write down your goal for 20 years. Now write down your goal for 100 years. So obviously when I say 100 years, it's not meant that you're here. It's meant to be what you want to leave as your legacy. What do you want to leave that goes beyond your lifetime? What do you want to leave? You know, when you read Hebrews 11 and you read about the great men and women of faith, one of the things that strikes me so much about Abraham is that it says of him, and he saw from afar, not what would be a reality in his lifetime, but he could see from afar, meaning he never saw the promise fulfilled in his lifetime. It wasn't even fulfilled in his son Isaac or his grandson Jacob. But it would be generations later, beyond Joseph, beyond 400 years in captivity, when Joshua, would lead them into the promised land after Moses. Abraham's promise is centuries. Do you have a hundred year promise? So I think of this. What if you're living by faith and yet you don't see God's promises, promise to you fulfilled in your lifetime? Do you have enough faith to believe for promises that go beyond your lifetime? Can you do that? So many of us struggle with what we don't have happen today, let alone next week or next month or this year. But can you develop faith 
that goes beyond your time of life. Can you dare to believe that God will still keep his promise even if you don't get to see it during your time on earth? And again, that's why Hebrews 11 is so powerful. And then Hebrews 12 verse 1 is also powerful where it says that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses but those who have gone before us. Is it possible that we might grow so intimate with God that we're able to keep loving him and serving him despite life's disappointments. Life will have setbacks. Life will have disappointments. You would like to think that the older you get in years, the more bliss it would be. It's like, God, I've gone through my teenage years. I've gone from the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, the 50s. Now, in my latter years, it should be more bliss, right? It should be just the pinnacle of reward. But sometimes, even in those latter years, your faith is still tested. The, the hope and the joy, the appointments you have in God are still tested. That's why I love, again, as I'm sharing this series from the book of Habakkuk, and again, as I say, Habakkuk is called a minor prophet. Minor not meaning insignificant, but minor meaning it's one of the smallest books. And Habakkuk is a good teacher for us on this lesson because it was not until the next generation after he had died, that God kept his promise where he would deal with the Babylonians. Remember, he's a righteous man. He's crying out as an intercessor, a prayer warrior, and he's saying, God, how can you just stay there, stand there, when your people, the people of Judah, do so much evil? How can your righteous God allow your people to be so bad? So God says, yes, I hear you, Habakkuk, and I will do something. Remember, the word Habakkuk means to embrace and wrestle. One minute he's embracing God, next minute he's wrestling with God. And God answers him and says, yes, Habakkuk, I I hear you and I see the same things and I'm going to deal with it. He's like, great, how are you going to deal with it? I'm going to bring in a foreign army, the Babylonians, and I'm going to bring them in and they're going to rout these people and they're going to do judgment on them. And he's like, God, how could you use such an ungodly people on your godly people? It's amazing how the story changes. One minute you're saying that the godly people aren't godly, and when God says, I'm gonna deal with them with ungodly people, he says, how can you do that? And God says, but I promise you, Habakkuk, that nation of Babylon will be dealt with because of the evil deeds. It's like David says, how is it, Lord, that it seems like my enemies who don't honor you seem to thrive, and we who honor you seem to only just get by? Why is it those who have wealth and riches who seem to blaspheme you seem to prosper and we who look to honor you seem to struggle? And God says, don't worry about them. I deal with them. Now with Habakkuk, God kept his word and the Babylonian empire would be dealt with, but it wouldn't be in Habakkuk's time. It would be in the next generation. You see, we need faith. We need hope to our dying breath. In the final moment that we go, I have this image of how I want to go to glory. I, I want to go like Jacob. And Jacob, you know, I heard you say this before. Jacob is 147 years old. And he calls in his sons and he calls in his grandchildren and he speaks a blessing. He speaks life. Some blessings was controversial versus Manasseh and Ephraim and the hand swapping. But he speaks a blessing. Then he tucks up his feet and he says, Goodbye. The only person I ever kind of seen in reality do that was uh, Pastor Brad Payne's mother. What was her first name again? Irene. And I I always remember how Irene went. Irene uh, was in hospital and uh, it was her final moments and she called in all the family and I think she brought them in individually as well, the grandchildren of of both sides was Pastor Brad's children and Pastor Brad's sister's uh, children and she brought them and she speak words. Some of the words were the most encouraging, and some of them were sort of like a like get it together. Uh, it, it was it was really challenging. And then after she'd done that, then later that night she went to glory. I, I find that amazing, triumphant how it happened. No fear of death, no fear of departure. But like Jesus, Jesus' last things on his mind wasn't the agony of the cross, but there was someone beside him who needed to know the truth. 
And even the final words of Irene wasn't on her departure, but on her loved ones she'd be saying for a while goodbye to. Can we have such faith? Can we have such hope that to the last moment, the final moments, we hold on to God's word, we hold on to the faith? Habakkuk gives me, hopefully you as well, three words. Three words that I think we can cling to when it may seem that God has not delivered on what he promises. There are three words that Habakkuk uses, and these three words mean something to me, and I'm hoping that these three words will also be a blessing to you to remember on your journey towards intimacy and ultimate trust and faith in him. And the three words are these, but the Lord. Say, but the Lord. But the Lord. Say it again. And you'll find these three words in the book of Habakkuk, chapter two, verse 20, where the prophet, after acknowledging that he still doesn't like what's going on, says this, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let everyone on earth be silent in his presence. In Hebrew, we'd say, Yahweh Shema, which means always there, always present. Yahweh Shema. And Habakkuk is saying here, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let everyone on earth be silent in his presence. In other words, even though I am upset, even though I'm angry and confused and frustrated, even though I am disappointed and impatient, I choose to remember who God is. It's like Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So here's a key. In our walk with God or in any relationship, we want it to be at the level that we understand. But our relationship with God isn't always available at the level of our understanding because God is beyond our understanding. God is beyond our thinking. God is beyond our thoughts. That's why, because people haven't seen God move in the miraculous as they want, they say, well, miracles don't happen anymore. That's because some people perhaps have been reckless with prophetic or other areas. They go, well, it doesn't work anymore. And because people have seen things, they no longer think it's relative. Or they've seen pastors fail, or they've seen this happen, or they've seen a loved one who is a believer fail. And because of these things, they lose hope because the hope is in the wrong place. Remember, Paul says in Romans 5, 5, hope does not what? Disappoint, which means undo the appointment God has for you. A hope that's based in God. That's why Hebrews 6, 19 says, hope is an anchor for our soul, our emotions. We have got to learn to anchor or secure our emotions because they're so inconsistent and unreliable. In other words, Habakkuk is saying, the Lord is still in charge and the Lord is good. He is righteous. He is true. He is faithful. He is all-knowing, all-powerful and ever-present. And I don't want to use Greek because I don't believe in the Greek words that we use here, but rather I'd use a Hebrew word called El Shaddai, which simply means Lord God Almighty. He is all-knowing, El Shaddai. He is always present, El Shaddai. He is wherever you need him, El Shaddai. He is the Lord God Almighty. The world may seem upside down, but the Lord is still there because he is sovereign. In Hebrew, I love the word El Elyon, which means the most high God. El Elyon, the most high God. The Lord is sovereign. And by sovereign, let me explain sovereign. We know the word sovereign means to rule or lordship. But our problem is in the Christian world is that we think that the word sovereign means that if God is Lord over everything, that God will intervene in everything. And that's the wrong interpretation of sovereign because the Bible always gives us an understanding of what things mean and he uses examples. For example, when people think that God is a cruel God who wants to beat you, that is the interpretation through men, women of the old. That is interpretation through today, but it's not the fullness because Jesus said of the old, they own in you in part, but in me you know in full. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, he says, if a son asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? If he asks for bread, will he give him a stone? How much more does your heavenly father love you? In other words, this. There is no way that a loving father would ever look to beat up 
or to maim or hurt or deprive a child. And Jesus gives a classic example of the prodigal son who forcibly requested his inheritance now, why? To go out into the world with prostitutes, with drinking and misbehavior. And the father knew what was happening, but the father stayed here and said, I'm here, son, and I wait for you. I can't go where you're going. But it doesn't say, and the father sent out men to beat him on the road, or the father sent out men to rob from him, or the father sent out men to make life hard for him. And that's how many times we portray God, that God somehow, because we haven't chosen to follow him, is waiting to beat us up or to curse us or to demean us. And that's not what's given in the Word of God. You have to be careful with revelation. Because revelation must be connected to Scripture. And if your revelation is not connected to Scripture, it's not God's revelation. Every revelation that's of God, whatever it might be, is backed up by Scripture. And if it's not backed up by Scripture, it's not God. That's why Jesus said, you know, I'm part. He was deep in the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 6, 7. Jesus says, you heard it said, those should not kill. But I tell you, if you say you hate a brother, you've committed murder. And so it goes on and on and on. You heard it said you should not commit adultery, but I tell you, if you look upon a woman and lust, you've committed adultery. It goes on and on and on. You heard it said that if I ask for your uh, shirt or coat, give him your coat, but I tell you, if you ask for your coat, give him your shirt as well. So it goes on and on. So Jesus is saying this, you have to remember that in the old, they didn't know in full, they only knew in part, but I've come to bring it fully to you. I'm bringing fulfillment, not a new doctrine. That's how it goes in the Word of God. And that's why we have to understand that God is not some God sitting up there to beat you up. So when it says sovereign, we're giving examples in the Bible of sovereign. We're giving examples in the Bibles of those who ruled, whether it be King David, whether it be King Saul, whether it be King Josiah, whatever else. And what sovereign means is that God is present. God is Lord. And everything is under his watch. But just like a king, they don't intervene in every area. That's what it means when we say God is sovereign. God is Lord. We have to call out to him. We have to stand in faith in him. We have to sometimes make sacrifice in him. But he has a plan, a much bigger plan than we can see. So the sovereignty of God is bigger than what we can see. It's bigger than what we can understand or acknowledge. So when I say God is sovereign, you say, well, if God is sovereign, how come I'm battling? It doesn't take away that God's sovereign. He is still Lord in your situation. He is supreme in all wisdom. He knows the end from the beginning. We are just his created beings. We're just his creation. We have to understand that he has everything under control. That's why El Elyon, that he is the most high God. And sometimes our faith is tested until it feels like hardly anything is left. And some of you have gone through life, and I've talked to you, some of you have gone through life, and your life has been so tested that you almost feel like you have no more faith. And that's what I'm sharing about tonight for a few minutes. Faith, believe. Faith, belief. Faith as a noun, belief as a verb. You might say, I believe in God, but do you have the substance of faith in God? Or you might say, I have the substance of faith, but do you believe the way you put it in action? See, this is how it marries together. This is what I love about Jesus and his teaching. He said this. If you just have faith as a speck, as the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains. So that faith is not the action, but it's a substance inside you that says, I believe. It's a substance. It's before you do it, it's I believe. It's a substance within you. If you want to believe, putting into action, and you're pressing in with all your might to move towards knowing God and trusting Him, then this is where faith evolves. If you want faith, if you want faith to be your very substance, if you want it proclaimed of you as a noun that you are a man or woman of faith, then it has to be the very thing in your heart that allows you to keep believing by practicing it. What if wanting to believe is enough? What if that tiny bit of barely noticeable faith is still pleasing to God or so pleasing to God? What if simply wanting to believe is the mustard seed of faith? 
Think of the father with his demon-possessed son. He said, Lord, help me to believe. Help me in my unbelief. There was a seed of faith to know that God was the answer. But could he believe enough to where they step out and have action? We hear about people who are put to test in circumstances that are every bit as painful and perhaps more personal than Habakkuk's. When I think of biblical characters whose faith is tested in extreme circumstances and I think about people who tell me that they lack faith or they tell me that they doubt God. I think of people like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And it's not just that this evil king called Nebuchadnezzar would demand that they fall to the ground and worship him and they said no. It's not just that the king says, I'm going to throw you into the furnace and heat it up seven, eight times higher. It's that even before this, their faith was tested. This is the remnant of Habakkuk's testimony. Habakkuk said the Babylonians would come. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were mere boys as that scripture was fulfilled. They came from a family of notoriety or influence. Their temple was destroyed. Their people were slaughtered. And anyone of influence or nobility was physically taken and removed a thousand kilometers away. There's no airplane or train. To a foreign land that worshipped other gods where the king himself said he is God. It would be like you being transported from here to Iraq when that dictator lived there and ruled Saddam Hussein. Where they declare another God or themselves as God and you've been forcibly brought to a different culture and belief system. And when you read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you think Habakkuk was having a hard time as the prophet who saw it, it was nothing in comparison to what these three young men would experience. He foretold it, they lived it. And when it says that they served in the king's palace, it meant that they were made eunuchs. Their personal organ was removed so that the king's harem would be safe from the desires of men. Even when you think of the Hebrew word that they had to go forth and multiply, it was a blemish on them. We read about these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but there's something like over a thousand who were taken into captivity. And the reason why we read about these three is because the other 997 or so people maybe bent their knees and gave up. But these three said, we will not defile ourselves by your rich food. I mean, who would think that food would be the tipping point? As the Muslims have halal, the Jews have kosher. You can look on Vegemite and not only see the halal sign, but you can also see the K with a circle, which is kosher. And for all of a sudden being in a foreign land and going for the humility of disgrace and what was done to them, never to be able to return to their land, they were commanded to eat the rich food. Now, many would say, well, you know what? Who cares? You know, what's wrong with a little bit of pork? What's wrong with a little bit of meat? What's wrong with a little bit of wine? What's wrong with a little bit of this? For what we've gone through, who cares? Look at the other 997. Who cares? With what we've gone through now, us dying is insignificant. Who 
care. See, that's always the problem. We say, who cares? And yet in the book of Isaiah, it says, and the Lord's eyes go to and fro over the earth, looking to see whose heart is towards Him. When you get tempted to throw it in, when you get tempted to give it up, when you get tempted to say, forget about it, I want you to be reminded of the Scripture in Isaiah that says, and the Lord's eyes go to and fro throughout the earth to see whose heart is towards Him. You see, you don't see it or you don't know it or you don't comprehend it, but the Spirit of the living God moves throughout this earth to and fro. And when you go for the agony of disappointment, when you go for the agony of defeat, when you want to quit, give up, withdraw, or no longer be a part of, What is it that pulls you away? Is it hurt? Is it disappointment? Is it anger? Is, 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 it, is, it, is it offense? Is it the desire for money? Is it the desire for success, ministry? What is it that pulls you away? The Bible says, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro over the earth. We see people who are put to the test in circumstances Every bit is painful and even more personal. They faced a terrible dilemma. Bow and acknowledge Nebuchadnezzar as their God or die. It's not unique to that time. There are many, many people who died under the Nazi Germany who were commanded to deny their faith, deny their God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that young preacher, merely 32, 33, was hung, he's a German, hung by the Nazis because he could not bow his knee to Adolf Hitler's way in theology and persuasion. Yet the very literature that Adolf Hitler used in hating the Jews came from a man of God that we celebrate, Martin Luther. And in Martin Luther's beginning years, that great German reformer, in Martin Luther's beginning years, he was a place of safe haven for Jews. And when the Roman Catholic Church was persecuted and killing, he said, come to Germany, you'll be safe. But when he found out that he couldn't convert them and lead them, he grew this disdain until his later years, he wrote books and literature about hating Jews that Adolf Hitler used to influence the believers of the day. Our lives are our responsibility before the living God. Nebuchadnezzar said, bow down and worship me instead of your God or we'll throw you into the fiery furnace. Their response is, we believe in a God who can deliver us. But we don't always understand God because he just might not. (laughs) We believe in a God who can deliver us. But then again, he just might not because Look what happened in Jerusalem. Look what happened to his temple. Look what happened to his priests. So, it's better to burn than bow. Just like Lazarus was raised from the dead days after he had died, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be delivered after they were thrown in the furnace. Sometimes it's past the hour, it seems. It's past the moment. As it was for Lazarus and Mary and Martha were doubting Christ, as it was for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when it might have seemed that things were too late. God is still God, and God is still moving, and God is still Lord. El Elohim. 
Yahweh Shema, the Lord is always here. When you have nowhere else to turn, when your own ideas and resources have evaporated, when your control of a situation is in shambles, it's Yahweh Shema. God is there. God is present. Yahweh Shema. God is present. He is always present. When your knees ache from kneeling in prayer, And you can't tell if he's listening. God is still there, Yahweh Shema. When people laugh at you and mocking your faith, Yahweh Shema, God is still present. When your knees ache for kneeling in prayer, but you can't tell if he's even listening, Yahweh Shema, God is there. When people laugh at you and mocking you, God is there, Yahweh Shema. When you don't know if you can make it another way, God is there, Yahweh Shema. And when the voice of your enemy is whispering to you that you should just give up, Yahweh Shema, God is there, God is present. The word for God is El or Elohim, which means powerful God, mighty God. El Shaddai, the one who's able to meet you in your need. But the most powerful descriptive name for God is Yahweh. Don't get caught up with that word Jehovah because it's not a Hebrew word, Yahweh. And it really means covenant. It means covenant. You can always see the word Yahweh in your Bible if you see the word Lord spelt with capitals. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's Yahweh. When you read Genesis 1 and you read about God, Elohim, so God, G-O-D, is Elohim. It's not personal. It just means powerful and mighty you'll never see that used on its own towards man. But when you read about Adam and you read about Eve, then you read about how Lord or Yahweh is always there. You might read Yahweh Elohim. And Yahweh Elohim, which we call Lord God. Yahweh Elohim, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Yahweh Elohim means God who is mighty and powerful, but also the God who is covenant and personal. When God reveals Himself to us, He doesn't reveal Himself to us as Greek gods would or as other gods would. That's why I disdain the Greek words we use. He doesn't just say, Elohim. It's Yahweh, Elohim covenant. In other words, He loves you. He loves you. He's not a Greek God that is absent from you. He's not a Greek God that has left you. He's the Hebrew God that is intimate to you. Yahweh Elohim. Elohim, powerful, almighty. Yahweh, covenant, Lord. I know you're like Adonai, but Adonai is lowercase. Capital L, little O, little R, little B. They came in years later because they got scared of the word Yahweh and Lord. This means Lord Almighty. So that's years later, hundreds of years later that was brought in. God didn't want you to know Him with a big L, little O, little R, little D, which is Adonai. He wanted to know you with a big L, a big O, a big R, and a big D, which is Yahweh covenant when you read your Bible and you see capital L capital O capital R capital D he's saying to you Yahweh Yahweh I love you Yahweh Elohim I love you and I'm the almighty God (laughs) I love you it's like picture a son or a daughter who is scared or terrified and they run to their dad or their mom and they scoop them up in their arms and they hold them. It's like God the Father saying, Yahweh Elohim. I don't know, Josiah must have only been about six or seven. You probably won't even remember it. But I remember I was preaching in an area in Louisiana and uh, It's just over the border from Houston. 
And uh, it was a big uh, Indian reservation. And by Indian reservation, uh, meaning that it, they had casinos on it because they were free from tax and blah, blah, blah. And there was a church there, uh, friends of ours, uh, way back then called Scott Nyling Coon. And they had a church there and their little uh, pastors, visiting pastors apartment that we could stay in had been flooded or damaged and it didn't work. It was bust. And the heat in Louisiana is incredible. I mean, like it is hot. So they put us into the um, hotel, nice hotel, on the Indian Reservation, so that's the casino. And uh, we, were, we were there ministering. And it, that, it was Saturday night or early Sunday morning, about 2 a.m. Sunday morning, round about there. Uh, we were in the bed and he had a little bed there that he was sleeping in, I don't know, six, seven years of age, right, Sandra? And all of a sudden, he woke up screaming, yelling, Dad, 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 just high pitch. I mean, so high, I'm surprised managers didn't come to the door. So I got up and I ran to him and he grabbed me and it was like a Habakkuk. It was an embrace, but a wrestle. And the wrestle wasn't against me, but he saw something I couldn't see. And I said, what is it? He says, Dad, it's gonna hurt you. It's gonna kill you. It's here, it's in the room. And he had this dream that came into a vision afterwards of this spirit that was manifested, that he saw wanted to kill me, not him wanted to kill me. So he came to me in covenant, just like God the Father does, which is Yahweh, meaning covenant, secure and safe. But then as I held him, I said, you need to understand Elohim, God Almighty. But you can't see it, Dad. I said, I don't have to see it. God sees it. It can't touch me. And it can't touch you. And I prayed holding him and he was restless and screaming and I prayed holding him. He was crying and yelling out. And I prayed holding him. I said, Father, show Josiah the power of God. Break the spirit. We command it to go. It was half an hour. I mean, he was so pooped the next morning and said, I went to church on my own. They, they just rested. He was so exhausted, literally. But to me, it's a great picture of Yahweh Elohim that you have Elohim, the God who's powerful enough to deal with those forces coming against you, but you also have Yahweh who is covenant, who wants to be in relationship with you. He loves you, He is for you. He will never leave you, He'll never forsake you. He'll never let you down. He may not do exactly what you want when you want, but He is always faithful. There's a Hebrew word here, which I like, it's called El Olam, means the everlasting God, El Olam, O-L-A-M. El Olam. He is the everlasting God from beginning to end. Lord, you are El Olam. You are the everlasting God. You are faithful no matter how much the circumstances may seem to indicate otherwise, no matter what happens in our life, the Lord is in His holy temple. Exactly what Habakkuk says. The Lord is in His holy temple. What does it mean? He has all authority. He sees all and knows all. And whatever you experience, whatever you're going through, wherever you feel that your hope has been taken from you, wherever you feel that you've been tested, wherever you feel it's been too much for you, God is there. And as Habakkuk's able to say, even though these things that are happening, and even though you forewarned me, and even though you told me, the strength I have is I know that you are there. Might not always move as I want, what I want, how I want, but you are there. Years might have gone by, days have gone, but He is there. He is there with you in the court case. He is there with you, the memories of your father. He is there with you when you feel discouraged with your children. He is there with you when you feel lost in regards to the call. He is there with you when sickness looks to ravish your body. He is there with you when you're about to go from this life to the next. He is there with you when you feel alone and abandoned because the one you love has been called the glory. He is there with you in every circumstance and situation. He is there with you in the valley of a divorce. He is there with you when your children and seem so distant. He is there with you. Yahweh Allah, the everlasting God. Yahweh Shema, 
is always present. El Shaddai, the nurturer, the carer, the lover of our heart, is always there. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. He won't forget you. So don't turn your back. Don't run. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't say it's over because it's not. It's not. God's bigger and greater. Can we bow our heads right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, Yeshua. Yeshua. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just speak your liberty and favor, your breakthrough, your wisdom and anointing. The anointing that breaks the yoke, that pulls down the chains. Father, I believe in you. I believe in your bigness. I believe in your strength. Even tonight at the healing service, I'm believing for miracles. I'm believing over hernias. I'm believing over back. I'm believing over sciatic nerves. I'm believing, Lord, over nasal areas and, and, and things that are happening in those areas. I'm believing, Almighty God, that, that cancer would go. I'm believing, Almighty God, for miracles. You say you have a situation in your life where you need hope right now. Would you stand to your feet? There's an area in your life where you need hope. Would you stand up? There's an area in your life you say, I need hope. I need that hope stirred up. I need hope. Would you stand to your feet? Father, give us hope. You said, Lord, in Romans 5, 5, that hope does not disappoint. You said in your word in Hebrews 6, 19, that hope is an anchor for our soul that holds us firmly, securely placed. In Romans 5, verse 3 and 4, Lord, you told us to rejoice in our trials and tribulation because through our trials and tribulations, we learn perseverance. And through perseverance, we learn hope. And Lord, we learn character, tested, proven character that sustains us. So therefore, Lord, whatever we're enduring, whatever we're going through, whatever it might be in our control or out of our control, I speak the light of God, the Shekinah glory, the light of God to be upon you, with you, and over you. And every thought and every contemplation that's not of God, I just rebuke it and bind it in the name of Jesus. I speak liberty and faith. 